Today we're going to be talking about the representation of members of parliament or MPs with regards to their constituencies, and also the representations for other groups, whether those groups inhabit those communities or whether or not it is a generalised representation. Because merv representation is still an argument many bring up because they feel that unless somebody is something that they can associate with, the person doesn't represent them, or the MP in this particular example, non-example, represents them, doesn't. Oh dear god, I'm going nuts already. To best demonstrate this, we have an article from The Guardian, I know, quality journalism, and also a tweet by Ian Lucas MP of the Labour Party for Wrexham. Wrexham, by the way, is much like every constituency in the United Kingdom, literally Haiti. But we'll get to that later, because I think I think it's pertinent to leave it to the end. So the article is written by Iman Amrani, and it is, what is the point of Muslim politicians if they don't represent their communities? Which, as far as titles go, is an inaccurate title, because the way an MP operates is, they are selected by the party to represent a constituency, and it's the views of that constituency they represent. Therefore, Unless the constituency is predominantly of the same community that seeks to have representation in Parliament that shares their views, which is going to be difficult because no one community truly dominates a constituency to the point where they will actually be heard through that person, then you are going to be hard-pressed to actually be able to say that a politician, specifically a Muslim politician, represents Muslims, which, as far as I am aware, they shouldn't in a more generalised sense, not as herderder Muslims bad mk. No, I mean in the sense that the Muslim politicians you're going to mention in this article will represent the constituencies that they stand for, and therefore the values for those that voted them in, as opposed to the entire constituency, because let's not forget here, people don't generally win with 100% of the vote. Therefore, even if they are voted in by a majority, there are still going to be those that they don't speak for, which I firmly believe is a good thing. It keeps that MP honest. Something that we'll come back to later, when Ian Lucas MP collects his P45. For those that don't know what that is, yeah, he's not getting re-elected. So going back to the article, Growing up, I rarely saw people who looked like me occupying important political positions. Minorities were far more likely to be represented in sport or entertainment than in real positions of power. That's debatable, as far as what power is, that is. But in 2019, there are more high-profile politicians from such backgrounds than ever. Sajid Javid, Chuka Umuna, Priti Patel, Sadiq Khan, to name just four. I can think of a few more, but sure, let's go with these four. So why, to me, doesn't this actually feel like progress? I would assume it's because you're making a mountain out of a molehill and placing all your eggs in the baskets of those of different colours, or a particular faith, although last I checked, I didn't think Chuka Umuna was a Muslim. In fact, the only time I've ever seen him discuss Islam, he actually stormed out of an interview with Dermot Monaghan, because he was meant to be discussing David Cameron, but instead got asked about a letter from Eric Pickles that was deemed patronising to Muslim leaders. And I know Sajid Javid isn't much as far as a practicing Muslim goes either, so I'm not entirely sure how solid this is on the face of it. And in before anyone says, oh, maybe it's because of Pakistani heritage. Chuka Amuna's family are Irish and Nigerian. So no, definitely not. When Khan won the London mayoral... Oh dear, I mispronounced that. Keeping it in because I can't be asked. Election as the Labour candidate in 2016, Sajid Javid tweeted... From one son of a Pakistani bus driver to another, congratulations. Understandably so, since he was up against Goldstein, who spent the entire time character assassinating Sadiq Khan, which actually he had some valid points on, but because of the way conservatives managed it, yeah, they set themselves up to lose, because they got arrogant. Kind of like Brexit. In 2018, the Windrush scandal broke, which touched a nerve throughout the country and rocked the Conservative Party. You're quite right. Files were lost, they were eventually found, people were unfairly being hit because of this administrative bungle, and the Rudd lied, lost her job, came back as work and pension secretary, that makes sense. All in all, it created and was 
predicated on the hostile environment argument, when Sajid Javid took over, it became a compliant environment. And the hostile environment was aimed at illegals, but of course some truly legal people were being targeted. So understandably, the conservatives brought this entirely upon themselves. Perhaps using hostile environment isn't the wisest tactic, but I get the point also of wanting to make sure illegal immigrants are gone. They are, after all, illegal. In an interview with the Sunday Telegraph at the height of the scandal, Javid said it felt close to home. I thought that could be my mum, my dad, my uncle, it could be me. And obviously he then was subsequently chosen to replace Rudd. He's done a pretty good job, to be honest, even if he has taken some rather unsavoury racist abuse for it, notably being called a coconut, which makes no sense, because coconuts have hair. Within weeks of being installed as the first Asian and first Muslim Home Secretary, he rejected a request by the Muslim Council of Britain for an independent inquiry into allegations of Islamophobia within the Tory party. There are a number of instances, or incidents, where Islamophobia has cropped up, with people subsequently being suspended, members most notably, not MPs, members. The most noteworthy supposed Islamophobic thing I can remember off the top of my head because I'm not going to bother looking into this, because let's face it, the Tories are Islamophobic, Labour are anti-Semitic. Fine, let's just move on, shall we? But the one I remember was when David Cameron said, Muslim communities need to do more to tackle Islamic extremism within their communities, which led to Baris Vazi calling him ignorant. And then there were accusations of Islamophobia because of it, but it was absolute nonsense. He was quite right at the time. Terror attacks were on the rise, after all. Now, he did say, the Muslim Council of Britain does not represent Muslims in this country, so we don't deal with the MCB, which he is right. They don't. There are too many different communities for the MCB to represent. Now, the article's writer believed that this meant Javid thought he represented Muslims in this country better than the MCB. It's not that at all. Let's just not legitimise the MCB too much, shall we? While landmark achievements for ethnic minorities can symbolise progress in terms of equality, meaningful representation matters more. I disagree. Equality is what you really should push for, not meaningful representation. And it sounds to me less like you're interested in equality and simply for representation, which is actually a bad thing if you only do it because of the ideas someone puts forward. Whether Sajid Javid is a good MP, that's down to his constituents. Whether he's good as Home Secretary, that is certainly up for debate. He's done quite a lot to clamp down on extremists coming home, which I have to admit, I give him considerable credit for having the balls to do. Of course it's important for people from diverse backgrounds to see reflections of themselves in positions of power, but it's what these individuals do with their power that really counts. Agreed. Which is why it truly baffles me that Barack Obama is still revered. In October last year, and with little done to change the hostile environment, Javid addressed the Tory party conference, quoted as saying, So what does the Conservative Party offer a working class son of an immigrant kid from Rochdale? You made him Home Secretary, as if one person of colour in office undoes years of racist policy making that has damaged and traumatised the lives of thousands of British people. It's nice to be able to take a good moment, and then just spin it and say, Yes, you did good, but what about everyone else? And I will say, I totally agree, we need to do more to help people from impoverished backgrounds. I say this from a position of living in what you would consider hand-to-mouth breadline for the majority of his life. But I promise you this, poverty knows no colour. Yes, some people do get held back. Yes, there are some communities that are separate from themselves, or from everyone else, sorry, and they themselves get held back. But it's not because of racism, it's self-segregation, and because of, well, bad luck, really. The only way you get anywhere in life is by putting in the hours, by putting in the hard work, by being willing to do better for yourself. Taking the easy way out, as many know, leads down a very dark path, and you will inevitably fail. On Javid's watch, chartered flights deporting long-term UK residents to Jamaica have restarted in what families describe as a double punishment. The hostile environment remains hostile, and Javid is its enthusiastic enforcer. Worse was to come. When Shamima Begum was interviewed at a camp in northern Syria last month, I struggled to feel sympathy for her. The fact she was 15 when she left Britain made the story extremely sad. But I certainly didn't think that somebody who had voluntarily joined a jihadist militant group should be rescued. I felt she should be put on trial in the UK. Disagreed. But when Javid revoked 
Begum's British citizenship, I was disgusted. Well, we can all disagree. The article continues with her predominantly railing on Javid, which shows her obvious bias because she doesn't really talk about Umuna, Patel, or Khan, even though Patel is conservative. So let's talk about Ian Lucas, who tweeted this out in response to Daniel Philip Hughes. <sighs> I know someone's going to quote Churchill. Might I point out, Churchill was wrong. I asked Skog, who showed me this picture on Discord, to tweet it out, but thankfully, my dear friend Ferret did it for me and tagged Theresa May, which I very kindly then replied by adding Corbin and Blackford. I would have added Burko, but I can't find his Twitter. Found some fan ones, though. They were interesting. The job of an MP is to represent their constituency. When the party they are a representative of is then in power, if they're in the cabinet, yeah, sure. They're not really representing their constituency anymore. They are representing a greater good, a bigger idea. But still, to their core, they are representatives of a constituency. You are not in the shadow cabinet, nor are you in the cabinet. Therefore, you represent a constituency of Wrexham. Not sure for how much longer, but I wish you the very best of luck with your version of democracy, where apparently you don't represent the people that voted you in. And I couldn't help but notice you essentially doubled down on it in your replies or subsequent tweets. That P45, hmm, best dust off that CV of yours. I don't think you should be including this on your CV. Anyway, I hope everyone has a lovely Monday, and thank you all for listening.